who else around here, and just by show of hands, who would be daring enough to admit that sometimes loving kids is hard, right? Or, or even, even more than that, who would be one to admit that sometimes loving your spouse can be really difficult sometimes, right? Not me. It's, it's pretty easy for me. Kind of probably raise your hand. But again, love, man, love is something that is really, really hard to do. And um, throughout this series, we're going through what we're calling What is Love? And we define love as simply a choice to place the well being of others above convenience. I think that's a really good definition because, again, love is not just a feeling, love is an action to, to put yourself in a position of humility to be able to serve someone in a way that would lift them up in such a way that they would know that you really care about them. And so, again, for us in this series, we're kind of talking about the complexity of love, and yet the call that we have to love people, to love God, certainly, but also to love people in such a way um, that, uh, that it would just change their minds and change their hearts and draw them closer to God. And so, this morning, I kind of want to set the stage for you a little bit with some tension. Um, it's a passage that some of you are probably very familiar with. It's actually the beginning of the Good Samaritan. Or I'm sorry, the, the parable. Yes, sorry, the Good Samaritan. Um, but it's this the circumstance where Jesus is talking with these teachers of the law in Luke chapter 10, verses 25. And it'll be on the screen. But just to kind of set the stage for you, Jesus in his ministry and in his life had been going throughout all Judea and just preaching the gospel, healing the sick, doing all these incredible things. And the teachers of the law, which again would have been like the professional uh, religious leaders of, of that day, they hated Jesus. Just to be totally honest, they hated Jesus. They thought he was such a hypocrite, he was a blasphemer. They thought he was just this crazy lunatic. And so they were constantly just looking for ways to judge him and looking for ways to condemn him in such a way that he would just have no more following behind him. And so on this one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. And teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And what is written in the law, Jesus replied. How do you read it? And the man answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. And again, Jesus replied, I said, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, the lawyer asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Now again, I think we just have to set the stage again just to say, you know what, today we're not here to just talk about something flowery. We're here to talk about some real hard stuff. And really, I find myself relating to this teacher of the law a lot. As a professional of that day, he would have been very well aware of all the Jewish laws, which again, there are 613 Jewish laws. He would have been abiding by every single one of them. I mean, he had it down to a T. He knew what it meant to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. But again, the second part of that great commandment, again, is to love your neighbor as yourself. And wanting to justify himself, the man asks, well, who is my neighbor? And again, I find myself very convicted in that, certainly because I don't love the Lord as much as I need to. And again, who of us would be willing to go on record and say, you know what, I've loved the Lord perfectly this week? Not a lot of us, if we're being honest, right? But certainly, if we're loving our neighbors as much as we love ourselves, and it's the way that God intends for us to, that's an even lower percentage of people that would probably say, yeah, I've done that perfectly this week, right? The question I think we kind of find ourselves relating to with this teacher of the law is that, again, who, who can I gloss over? Really what he's asking is, who can I leave out? For those of you that are taking notes, that's really the question this man is getting at. Who can I leave out? Who can I get away with not loving? Again, this man, was, was the perfect example of what it meant to be a Jewish leader, to be a Jewish, a devout Jew in that, time, in that day and age. And so for him to ask this, again, he's just looking for an opportunity to justify himself. And following this, this is where Jesus goes into the story of the Good Samaritan. We're actually not going to preach about that today. We're actually going to be looking at some different places in Scripture. But I just want to set that, again, as a, as a, a bar for us today to just realize, look, like we have a very high calling, Right? We have a very radical calling to love the Lord, absolutely, but also an equally radical calling to love our neighbors and love other people as God loves us. And so, with that in mind, would you just join me in prayer one more time this morning? <clears throat> Father God, we are so thankful to you, Lord, that you give us your word. And Lord, it is, it's hard to swallow sometimes. It is a very, very tough pill to swallow. Um, God, help us 
just to be realistic and to be honest with ourselves about how we love each other. Lord, it's, it's, a, it's a very high calling, but it's a demand that you've left upon us, Lord, to not leave anybody out. And so, God, our desire is that simply you would just transform our hearts. Lord, open our hearts to whatever you would have to reveal to us this morning. We'll uh, leave the rest to you, Lord. We, we ask this all in your name. Amen. Now, again, two weeks ago, we defined love, again, as a choice to place the well-being of others above convenience. And with that said, love is a lot more complicated than that, right? It's not just a choice. I mean, it is a choice, but really, when you get down and dirty to it, you know, you have to get the rubber on the road. How do we love people in such a way that it points them to God? And so, again, as much as we would love to say, well, sure, you know, I, I don't have any exceptions in the way that I love people. I don't have those people that I, I you know, there aren't people that I avoid on our purpose. But if I'm being honest, if I'm going to share a story with you guys, there are some people in our community that I've found, I just, I have a hard time dealing with, and especially as a sub, like, I, I get to see kind of some of the ugly sides of kids um, in our community, and it's hard to love them sometimes. And I think we can all admit, if we can just be honest today, it's okay. Like, we have those people, and by those people, I mean the people that we are just totally annoyed by, the people that just irk us to no end, the people that we really just don't want to have anything to do with, right? But yet, those people are some of the people that need us the most. Those are some of the people that need real love in such a way that it would transform their hearts. And that only, again, happens because of our decision to love them. But again, some people, if we're just honest, some people are messy, right? Some people hurt us. Some people lie about us. Some people gossip about us. Some people intentionally hurt us. Most people are hypocritical at some point in their life. Just by show of hands, you know, who all has lied at some point in their life, right? I mean, pretty much all of us, or hopefully all of us, you know? Like, we're not here to be some sort of people that, you know, we are higher than me and whatnot. You know, love, we are all called to be on an equal plane. We know we are dirty, we are broken people that have led sinful lives, but only through the grace of God. You know, we have come to a place where we can have fellowship with Him and encourage people to love Him as well. And so... That being said, I want to kind of take us back into the love chapter, which is 1 Corinthians 13. Again, I think I've shared with you guys before, uh, most people have this read at their weddings, but for the context, that the church in Corinth that Paul was writing to was really having some issues with worship and kind of lifting other people above others because of some spiritual gifts that some people were gift, gifted with, whereas others were not. And so Paul was writing to them kind of just to give them a little smack. Just a little note, like, hey, like, this is not proper. This is not the correct way to live and to, to lead your lives. And so Paul is writing to them, and he goes on further into 1 Corinthians 13, where he's talking about how much greater love really is than all the spiritual gifts combined. And if everything goes away, at the end of the day, if all you have is love, you still have more than anything else in the world. And so with that in mind, we're going to pick up in verses 4 through 7. It says, love is patient and love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. Love does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. And then, I'm using the ESV translation here, but it says, Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Now again, we've heard a lot about love, and we know that Love is our calling. Love is what we are called to do. But again, I, I look at those things that Paul writes, and as much as I would love to be able to replace love in every single one of those verses with my name, that doesn't happen, right? And if we're being honest, none of us can really replace, our, replace love with our name, right? You know, we, we're called to love, but sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm very impatient. Sometimes I can be unkind, those sorts of things. I think a lot of us, you know, sometimes we struggle with keeping records of wrongs. Some of us, you know, it's fun actually kind of to delight in evil, if we're being honest. It's kind of fun to see bad things happen to people. That's so evil. And yet love has nothing to do with that. And so, again, there, there's sort of a disconnect there, right? You know, there's what we are called to do, but yet there's actually what we do. And so how can we make these a reality where there's not really this, this actual... Um, this disconnect between love and what, how we live. And so for us today, the question is really, how can we lead a life like that that really 
lets people know that we love them, not just in word, not just by something we say, something we feel, but again, how do we choose to love people in such a way that we really could replace love in that passage with our name? And so, again, God here is teaching us something, and I want, I want you guys to write this down. It says, no matter our shortcomings, God wants us to discover the fullness of life through love. Again, just as a little bit of a hope, because again, I beat you up a little bit this morning, I apologize for that, but we have to kind of set the stage for that. But no matter our shortcomings, God wants us to discover the fullness of life through love. And what I mean by that is simply not that there's some secret that you, uh, you've come upon in your relationship with Christ. It's not that there's some secret way to love people, but no, like how can we experience a fullness of love? Because most often, when love happens, when love is taking place, when we're experiencing love, either giving or receiving, love is something that leaves us just feeling better about ourselves, doesn't it? It's just kind of how love is. Love is the universal language. Like, everyone understands what it means when you hug somebody, right? Everyone understands what it means to simply give a pat on the back for something, you know? Like, love goes beyond words a lot of the time. And so love, again, is this calling, it's this mandate that we've been given by God to inspire other people through it. And so, again, as much as we would love to replace love with our names, it doesn't sound like there's really a lot of hope for us, right? But I want to look back a little bit further in Scripture to the book of Hosea. Now, for those of you that may not have even been familiar with this book, this is an incredible, incredible story of God's transforming love in the lives of ordinary people. Again, Hosea, in his day and age, he had already been a part of the nation of Israel once they had split into two nations, both the nation of Israel and the nation of Judah. And Hosea was specifically a prophet for the nation of Israel. He was this man that had been very well versed in all the Jewish laws. He'd already had his ministry. And so by the end of his life, though, he's experiencing a lot of these trials that God kind of brings into his life. And so with that, I kind of want to pick up in his story. It'll be on the screen, but it's Hosea chapter 1, verses 2 through uh, 9. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go, marry a promiscuous woman, and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. Now just stop right there. Aren't you guys, for those of us that are married here, aren't we so thankful that God doesn't tell us to go marry a promiscuous woman, right? Can we just say amen to that? Like, that's not what we, that's not what we would intend to happen in our lives. But yet, here's God calling you to do this, and so we keep reading through. So he married Gomer, the daughter of Dilbam, and she conceived and bore him a son. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre at Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. In that day I will break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. Okay, a little bit of context there. There's lots of names there. But the main one I want to point out to you is Jezreel. Jezreel was this um, pagan uh, interloper that kind of been mixed into the nation of Israel further back in their history. And so for them, at this time, Jezreel... Um, he was he was alive in the time of the king of Ye of Jehu, and so Jehu's descendants they all had gathered up the people of Jezreel and all of his tribe, and they massacred them for their crimes against the nation of Israel. And so when God's calling Hosea and telling him to name his child Jezreel, he's really going back and pointing to judgment, the judgment that happened because of their inability to serve faithfully their inability to love in the way that God wanted them to love. And so, again, the significance there would be that Jezreel was this name that would kind of bring up this stirring amongst the Jewish people of judgment and this impending doom, more or less, just to be honest with you. And so, we pick up from there. Gomer conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. Then the Lord said to Hosea, call her Lo Ruhama, which means not loved. Don't you love that for a name? Wouldn't you love to have that? It's like the equivalent of being named Butt Sniffer or something like that. <laughs> like, it's a very unfortunate name. But again, for I will no longer show love to Israel that I should at all forgive them. Yet I will show love to Judah and I will save them, not by bow, sword, or battle, or by horses or ten horsemen, but I, the Lord their God, will save them. Now again, her name means not love. Like, how awful is that? Can you imagine growing up and that being your name? I bet if, you, know, you probably had some issues being bullied or something in high school, right? Like, it's a lot of issues there. 
But continuing on, after she had weaned Lo to Hama, it gets even better. Gomer had another son, and the Lord said, Call him Lomi, which means not my people, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. Man, doesn't that just sound like a really cheery, happy, you know, happy way to just kind of lead into scripture? You know, what is God getting at? I feel like this would be the newest hit reality TV show. It's like my wife sharing my wife and my kids that just have the worst dumpster names. Like, uh, these, these are the most ridiculous names they could possibly have. So we're left with the question, you know, what is God getting at? Like, why would God call Hosea to marry this woman that is very well known as a prostitute? And it's arguably, you know, is she really having these children with Hosea? Like, that's one of the questions you kind of have to ask yourselves. But yet again, Hosea is called to love her and to be, his, to be her husband. Like, that's not exactly what we intend and envision as this perfect idea of a marriage, right? But again, God does not leave it there. He leaves it with this perception of, you know, there is, there is brokenness, and yet there is a plan. And so we're actually going to discover kind of his purpose in chapter 2. At the very end, it's verses 21 all the way through chapter 3, verse 3. In that day I will respond, declares the Lord. I will respond to the skies, and they will respond to the earth. And the earth will respond to the grain, and the new wine, and the, and the olive oil. And they will respond to Jezreel. They will respond to the judgment they will receive. I will plant her for myself in the land. And I will show my love to the one I once called, not my loved one. I will say to those called, not my people, you are my people, and they will say, you are my God. I just want to pause right there. Is that not your story? Because that's my story, right? Like, we all have gone astray. We've all lived lives of sin. That's just the reality of our brokenness as a man, as, as humanity. We are all guilty of falling away, of not being God's people, not being the people that love him, and certainly not deserving of his love. And yet, despite all that, God calls us and says, you know what? You are my child. You are loved. Like that's just a beautiful story already there. But it doesn't just stop there with his kids and their names and how God kind of restores that whole scenario. But with Gomer specifically, we read on. The Lord said to me, Go, show your love to your wife again. Though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress, love her as the Lord loves the Israelites. Though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. Which again, if it's bad thing to love raisin cakes, I'm very guilty of that. I grew up on those little Debbie, Ra uh, little Debbie raisin cakes. And so Hosea goes, and he bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a lethic of barley. And I told her, you are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man, and I will behave the same way toward you. Now again, like what is God getting at? What does this all have to do with love, how does this apply back to us? Gomer, in her brokenness, should have been the farthest person away from being loved, right? But again, Hosea, in his love for her, like, he knows that he has to stay indebted to her. He has to stay faithful to her, regardless of whatever she does. And so, he buys her back from the modern-day equivalent of a pimp. Essentially, that's what he does. He has to go and buy her back from her pimp. And so, he buys her, and he tells her again, as much as I love you, and, you know, and in my love, I have to restore you to a faithful wife position. And so he tells her, you know, just blunt and honest, you cannot be a prostitute anymore. You cannot be intimate with any other man. But if you do this, I will be faithful to you for the end of my life. Like, that's a beautiful portrayal of love right there. Now again, I know it feels like Hosea's family would have been perfect on Mari or something like that. Like... But God had a purpose for all this to show the Israelites and the rest of the book of Hosea is all these omens and yet these prophecies that God is going to fulfill later on through Jesus. We have the, we have the benefit of knowing what happens next in the story. And so this love shown through Hosea and through Gomer's life and through their kid's life is this beautiful portrayal of the love that God shows us in spite of all our sin, in spite of all our brokenness. God loves us. So again, how does this all relate back to us loving our neighbors? Well, yes, we are called to love God with all our heart, all our soul, mind, and strength. But we now start to realize again how equally radical it is for us to love our neighbors in the same way. Even when people don't deserve it, right? Even when people give us every reason not to be patient, you know? 
We are called to be patient. We're called to love them. We're called to be kind, even when people are just downright nasty with us, right? When people give us every reason to be angry, we are called to let go of grudges. Again, when it would be so easy to crush somebody's reputation because it would just be fun, just to be honest, you know? We're called to let go of it. We're, to, we're called to let go of those who have wronged us. We're called to lift them up. When people are clearly trying to stir things up in us that make us sensitive and make us mad, make us say things that we're going to regret, right? That's an opportunity for us to rejoice in the truth because in that whole situation, you know, when they do those things that make us mad and kind of stir us up a little bit, there's some truth in that, you know, that, that, that shows that there's an area for us to grow in, right? Whether it's your temper, your habits, your ability to load the dishwasher properly, right? Our destructive patterns of shutting others out when they are trying to help us. We all have to deal with some real, deep-seated issues, and that's okay. We are called to endure it, because that's what love does. Again and again, I'm reminded of how inadequate I am in my own ability to love as God expects me to. But you know what I'm learning more and more as I grow up and as I just discover more about our community? Like, it has so little to do with me, just to be honest. It has so little to do with me. The only reason I'm able to go and to sub and to love on some of these kids that really just don't deserve love is because God has empowered me to do so. And that's true for all of us. The only reason we're able to go through life and to love people at all is only through God's grace. It's only through his ability to show us real love. Again, all of us in our brokenness, we are so deserving of wrath. We're deserving of judgment. And God would have every right to destroy us for everything we've ever done. You know, even the smallest little lie, God hates it. He hates sin. Not because it's just something that we do wrong, but because it really just, it, it makes a disconnect between us and God. God can't stand it. But real love, real love acknowledges sin, right? Sometimes we can love people enough to tell them that I hate your sin. That's something we can do. Again, we have to be very careful when we do that, that we don't just burn bridges. But, you know, real love causes us to be open about the truth, to be open about issues that really, really can provide conflict and, you know, just break our relationships with other people. But loving our neighbors, it only happens through the grace of God. It only happens when we realize that, man, like, I, I can't do it on my own. As much as I want to replace love in that passage in 1 Corinthians 13, I cannot do it on my own. But I can replace love with Jesus, right? I can say through all that entire list, I can say that Jesus is patient. I can say Jesus is kind. Jesus does not envy. He does not boast. He's not proud. He doesn't dishonor others. I'm just so reminded when I look at that list and I think back to all Jesus' life and I look at how he loved people. Man, he was so good at it. Like, he loved people enough to tell them when they were sinning, when they were going down destructive paths in life. And yet he also had the ability to love them and pick them up off their feet. He was willing to get messy, you know, kind of roll up the sleeves. As Andre even mentioned last week, you know, kind of putting on your boots to go down in the mud and the muck of people's lives. It's messy. I don't have to tell you that. You guys know that people can be really messy sometimes. But again, through the grace of God, we can all love people in such a way that it brings them back to him. Because again, we all realize, and we know this, we all know that we're creating the image of God. But some people, they don't realize that. A lot of people kind of live their lives in a pattern of guilt and shame where they just are so convinced that they are worthless, right? Like at the core of it, if you were really to boil it down to the very core issue, a lot of people live their lives in regret. A lot of people live their lives in just shame. They feel like they don't fit. I mean, again, the modern day equivalent for one of Hosea's kids would have been an outcast. That's what her name would have meant, or his name would have meant. And we have lots of people in our society and our community that are just outcasts. And so I'm not asking of you today to simply just love people and, you know, just leave thinking that you're loving people. No, like, there has to be an action attached, right? There has to be an action, because love cannot just be a feeling that we just leave under a rug. It can't just be something we set on the table and just say, here it is, come get it, right? Love is us going after people. And so, friends, I want to challenge you this week. 
you find one way to love somebody that honestly doesn't deserve it. It could be one of your kids, it could be your neighbor right across the street, or right beside you. You know, I mean, it could be the grocery store clerk that you can tell is having an awful day. I'll, I'll share a little bit of a story with you earlier this week. Uh, I was in the Dollar General right down the road, and this, uh, this family had been coming through and had several items. And um, as much as I uh, just struggled sitting there, I'm very impatient when it comes to grocery lines. I'm sure a lot of you guys can relate. I, I just, I can't stand having to sit there. But, you know, I said, okay, I'm just going to be patient. No big deal. Well, this woman probably went through about 10 cards, and none of them are working. None of them are working. And so I'm, I'm thinking about it. You know, maybe I should pay for her stuff. You know, maybe I should. And I'm going through, and I'm looking at her items, and, you know, I see a pretty significant amount of alcohol. And so um, I, I decided, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Not because I don't love her, not because I don't want her to be able to provide in whatever need she has, but, you know, I, I did have a conversation with her, though. I, I tracked her down in the parking lot, and I said, you know what, like, I really was thinking about paying for your stuff, and I want you to know I'm, I'm sorry that I didn't, but I want you to know, like, I really appreciate you, and I love you, and I, you know, I want to be able to pray for you if that would be okay with you, and she let me do that. And again, I didn't have to love her enough to buy her alcohol. I did not want to enable any of her addictions or whatever they may have been. Again, I'm just assuming. But real love does not have to be you enabling somebody for a destructive pattern. Love can be you simply just saying, hey, an encouraging word and praying with somebody. Love can be as simple as you just smiling, leaving a sticky note on somebody's desk at work. Whatever it looks like, that's real love. It's not just a matter of what we say. It's not just a matter of how we feel. It's a choice. And again, my challenge for you is to be, to choose to love someone like that this week. It doesn't have to be super radical. It doesn't have to be going and praying someone, leading them into salvation. It's great if you do, don't get me wrong. But don't romanticize it. Just choose to love somebody this week. <laughs> In traffic, maybe, later on this week, you know, if someone is just making you mad and you want to honk your horn, maybe give them the Hawaiian sign for I love you, don't. <laughs> like, you know, just choose to be patient. Choose to see them and how their lives are going. The last word I just want to leave with you guys is simply, the only way to love like Jesus is to surrender to Jesus. And I say that, and there's a lot of baggage that comes connected with that. But I think we all would agree, in some level, that we want to love people, right? We want to love like Jesus loves. And sometimes, we can still love, but a lot of the times, we have our own preconceptions about what love should look like. You know, we, we assume that people have to fit this certain criteria for me to love, and they have to fit this specific way. But if you look at Jesus' life, he had no criteria. He had no barriers to who was deserving of love, right? Jesus was this radical man that just simply called people to an awakened life, to move on from brokenness and sin, and he loved them along the way. And that's our calling. If we want to love like Jesus, we have to surrender to Jesus. And sometimes surrendering means letting go of some of our preconceptions about people, you know? It's easy to assume maybe someone's in drugs, and sometimes we're right. But again, whether or not we may be, the assumption, we still have to decide to set those assumptions away and love those people exactly as they are. Because again, every single person, whether they believe in Jesus or not, is made in the image of God. They all have worth in God's eyes. And just maybe, just maybe, a little act of love, a little decision to love can inspire someone to become the next evangelist. You know, I was, we were kind of remarking with, uh, with some of our Bible study on Thursday with the story of Paul. Paul was this man that had no right, honestly, no right to be a leader of the church. He hated all the early Christians of his day for his conversion. And yet, despite all that, God turned it around and used it for something good. You know, that's our story. That's all our stories to some extent. But God can use one of us, use one of you, to change someone's life for the rest of their lives, and maybe impact the world. You don't know. And so again, just my, my desire, my, my passion really is just simply to see that love would have its day. Again, hate has had too much time. Division has had too much time. But politics, who cares? 
just honest, you know? I mean, stuff like that, it's so easy just to get angry at people these days. I get it. I'm totally with you. There are people on my Facebook feed I just want to unfriend immediately. Like, I would love just to unfriend them. But for the purpose of love, and then look at God's words, and look at Jesus' life and ministry, I can't do that. We can't do that. We can't give up on people. That's what love calls us to do. And so that's, that's what I have for you this morning. Again, it's, it's a passion that we all must, we have to embrace. Love is too important to keep, to keep underneath the sheet, to just put it on the table and say, you know, come and get it. Love has to be something we go and give to people. So would you pray with me this morning? Father God, we are so just amazed by you, Lord, that you love us in spite of all our sin. Lord, you love us enough to teach us how to live for you. God, I thank you for everyone in this room and the honor that it is just to read your word and to teach your word. God, help my words just to phase more and more into yours. That you would hide me in your cross. God, help us as we go that we would choose to love people exactly as they are. Help us not to over-romanticize it, not to be too scared or distracted by what would leave us behind, that would, that would inhibit your love from having its way in people. God, help us to be people that love radically. Help us be people that really love people. Lord, I thank you again just for everyone in this room. Thank you for the honor that it is to be here, just to worship you. Lord, we love you and help us to, uh, to be safe as we go until we come together again. Lord, we ask this all in your holy and precious and powerful name. Amen.